Anyway, I love that song. Thank you so much for the good singing. It's so important for us to sing congregationally. It is what Scripture encourages us and commands us to do, singing together in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And so important it is for us to sing together. And thank you so much for the good music already today. Joshua chapter number 10. Joshua chapter number 10. Again, this is a passage of scripture, a chapter that has some interpretational challenges. Again, if there's any struggles or challenges with interpretation, it's because of us. It's because of our own fallibility and our own small mindedness. It's not because scripture is too complex or too secret or too mysterious or too complicated. God's holy word is the infallible, inspired, authoritative word of God. And there are passages that are challenges interpretationally. They, they uh, are good for us, though. Uh, it's important for us. Sometimes, uh, I, I, I don't mean this in the wrong way, but, but sometimes we need some broccoli and some Brussels sprouts, so to speak. Uh, we need some asparagus. We need some good veggies. We need the meat of the word. We need the milk of the word. And it's important for us to sometimes have to dig a little deeper and to think a little bit more. We're, uh, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here. I'm sorry <laughs> to start off with. But we're, we're, we're not good Bible thinkers sometimes. It's so important for us to be good Bible students. All of us doesn't mean that we have to be called to vocational ministry. All of us are to be, in a sense, Christian theologians. We're, we're all to know the Word of God. And sometimes uh, it's easy for us to gravitate to the passages uh, that are a little bit easier, if I can say. And there's nothing wrong with that, not at all. But it's important for us to dig in and to, to, to have to uh, deal with some of even the, 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 the harder uh, sections of, of Scripture. Uh, and, and Joshua 10 is, is one of those, a glorious, glorious victory. But it comes with a miracle of supernatural, of course, epic proportions, because it is God himself who does really two incredible supernatural miracles in this chapter. And one of them presents itself as a little bit of an interpretational challenge that scholars through the years, and as I've read through several commentaries, uh, they have even grappled with this. But let's go to Joshua 10 and let's go to verse number 1. And we see that it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore... Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, to Piram, to Japhia, and to Deborah, these other kings, saying, Come up unto me, verse 4, and help me that we may smite Gibeon. We already know from chapter 9 in verse number 1 that a confederacy of Canaanite people groups had formed to try to form an armed resistance against Israel. Israel had conquered Jericho, had conquered Ai. Israel was splitting the northern part of Canaan from the southern part of Canaan. It was a magnificent battle strategy, of course. It was orchestrated by God himself. And now as they are coming into the mountainous area around Jerusalem, as they have defeated Jericho and Ai, there is now a united front. These people groups of the Canaanites thought that in their stubborn rebellion and resistance that they could somehow, by uniting together in a confederacy, that they could somehow hold off Israel and the Lord God Jehovah from the conquest of Canaan. We talked about this last week, the stubbornness of man. He who is often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Here is a confederacy in spite of the fear of God that had swept across the land, that had paralyzed Jericho, that Rahab spoke about, here there was still this stubborn obstinacy and rebellion and defiance against God by this confederacy. And they thought that they could form an armed resistance and hold off Israel and the Lord God Jehovah from the conquest of Canaan. Well, now in chapter 10, 
having heard that Gibeon had converted, we talked about this last week, Gibeon had come in saving faith. I believe they came in saving faith and under the mercy of God, separating from their Canaanite peoples, separating even from their Amorite and Hivite people groups as a tribe of, or a family of Gibeonites with four city-states, they had identified themselves with Israel and Israel's God, coming, of course, at first in deception and with the treaty, which was a compromise, yet God in his mercy saved the Gibeonites. They became assimilated with Israel. Well, what do we often see with young believers, with new converts? It's not unusual for young believers, for new converts, upon trusting Christ as their Savior, to immediately come under attack, to even be ostracized by their own family or shunned by their own family. Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem. Here we see Jerusalem mentioned. Jerusalem had been mentioned before in Genesis 14 when Melchizedek, king of Salem, came out after Abraham had rescued Lot and Abraham paid tithes to to Melchizedek. It was Melchizedek who was a type of Christ in Genesis 14 who was a saved Gentile king who was the king of Salem, Jerusalem. Now there is a Canaanite people group led by Adonai Zedek who is the king of Jerusalem. Adonai means Lord. Zedek is probably a reference to a pagan god. Here we're going to see, first of all, vengeance against the new converts. Vengeance against the new converts. We read here that Adonai Zedek gathered with him these other kings. They are mentioned in verse number 3. Hoham, Piram, Japhia, and Deborah. So five total. They decided to break from the larger confederacy and take on the Gibeonites. So we have this large group of confederate nations of the Canaanites. And now we have this five king confederacy. They saw a weakness in their minds. The Gibeonites joining with Israel, converting to the uh, Jewish nation of Israel, submitting to the Lord God Jehovah, as even Adonai Zedek mentions, he says, they have converted, they have made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel, verse 4. So they see this as an opportunity to strike a weak point in their minds of the Israel invasion, of the Israelite army, of the Israelite peoples. So he gathers with him Hoham, king of Hebron. This is a mountain city. 30 miles south of Jerusalem. He gathers Piram, king of Jarmuth, 18 miles from Jerusalem, which would later become part of Judah's inheritance as well as Hebron. Japhia, king of Lachish, would also in this area become part of Judah's inheritance. This is where later at Lachish, Amaziah, king Amaziah was slain. Sennacherib, the Assyrian general, would besiege this city in the future, and later Nebuchadnezzar would conquer Lachish, recorded in the Babylonian invasion of the southern kingdom in 605 B.C. or 586 or 597 during one of those incursions that eventually Nebuchadnezzar would destroy Jerusalem. So Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Jerusalem, and then also Eglon, all of which would later become part of Judah's Inheritance. These are all cities in what would be considered the southern parts of Canaan near Jerusalem. We're talking about a mountainous area. I don't have a map on the screen behind me, but if we could picture in our mind's eye, if we could picture Israel, we're talking about the very land that is in the headlines each and every day. We're talking about the city of Jerusalem that is Israel's capital city that is in the news every day just about. This is the time where God brought his people into Canaan and they conquered this area that belongs to this day to Israel. 
in these five city-states or in that southern area surrounding Jerusalem, and this is going to be a part of the southern campaign as God in his providence is now bringing not just a larger confederacy of Canaanite peoples, but now a smaller confederacy where Israel is going to have the opportunity to defeat entire armies of the Canaanites besides just one city at a time. We can see the strategy militarily by Joshua and Israel, but we see God orchestrating here for a breakthrough, a conquest of the southern half of Canaan. So these five kings and their stubbornness and their defiance against God in their attempt, they think, to find a weak point and exploit that weak point, they go after the Gibeonites. And they gather their army, and we read there that the Gibeonites call out. Verse number six. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. And help us. So the Gibeonites now see this Confederate army, this army of these five Confederate kings that have gathered together and they're coming and they're threatening Gibeon. Remember, there was a treaty, there was a covenant between the Gibeonites and Israel. It was part again of God's mercy and how God would save the Gibeonites, but Israel was bound by covenant before God to protect the people of Gibeon. This army of Canaanites was surrounding Gibeon, was on its way to invade, and the Gibeonites cry out. And literally they say, do not delay, slack not thy hand from thy servants. Don't delay, don't waste any time. We are under severe threats. And again, it's not unusual for new believers new converts to come under attack for their newfound faith. We can think of some false religions that hold their people very, very, very strongly. And if a family member converts to Christianity, they are shunned, they are cast out, some of them are persecuted. I think of a Muslim convert, Nubel Qureshi, I read his book, uh, seeking, uh, I think it was Seeking Allah and Finding God, something like that. Uh, it's a great book, wor well worth reading. He is with the Lord now, but I remember Nabel Qureshi in his book talking about when he converted to Christianity from Islam, how his family basically pronounced curses on him. They shunned him, they excommunicated him, they hated him. This is not uncommon in places where there is rampant paganism and false religion. And for a family to leave, to convert, for a family member to convert to Christianity, they could suffer for that in very severe ways. And the Gibeonites, in a sense, were in that place. They were new converts. And now this five-king Canaanite confederacy was coming to attack them, seeing this as an opportunity to even to do damage against Israel. So they go to war against Gibeon. The Gibeonites cry out for help. They say, do not delay. And I think, again, the fact that they called out to Israel is a evidence of their saving faith. That they look to Israel, they look to Israel's God for help and not back at some Canaanite group. I think it's, again, an evidence of their salvation. Verse number seven, Joshua ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men, men of valor. So they don't waste any time and they take the whole army. These are new converts. These are Gentile peoples that are just now being assimilated into Israel. And Joshua takes the whole army. He doesn't just say, oh, we'll send a, a small percentage. No, he is keeping this covenant and he is keeping it fully. And he sends the whole army. He and the army, all the mighty men of valor. This is 25 miles from Gilgal to Gibeon. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. 
So it's significant that we recognize this because this was a 25 mile trip. Quickly, the army formed together. God, in verse number eight, grants them his blessing and they march all night 4,000 feet from Gilgal to Gibeah. This is a 4,000 foot elevation from Gilgal to Gibeah. They do this in a mountainous, rocky, hilly area at night as an army to take on the enemies of Israel and of Gibeah and to help rescue them. This was not an easy march. There have been some battles, and if you've studied any kind of wars, you've seen probably some incredible battle strategies by some generals who have marched their troops in just terrible terrain or under severe circumstances, bad weather, whatever the case may be. But they go all night without all of the modern conveniences that we have today with all of our battery-operated this and battery-operated that. They're going probably by torch and lantern, and they are going through mountainous terrain with rocks and hills all night for 25 miles 4,000 feet in elevation to Gibeah to defend them and to continue in their conquest of Canaan. God gave them orders to go into battle. They knew they had God's blessing, but they still had to follow through with what God had promised. As he told them to fear not, they still had to act upon that promise in faith, putting Hiking boots, war boots, combat boots on, literally, to obey the Lord and to fulfill his promise. And we're going to see applications, I think, to this in our own Christian life as we see the similarities. And we see the comparison of Israel and their conquest of Canaan and us as believers in the Christian life. Where there's going to be some difficult days. There's going to be some rough terrain There's going to be some higher elevations. There's going to be some enemy armies and some enemy kings. So we see this attempt at revenge or vengeance against these new converts. But then secondly, we see rescue. We see rescue by God and his people. Verse number nine. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all nights. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. And chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horn, and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass, verse 11, and as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah. And they died. There were more which died with hellstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So it's now morning, I would imagine it's daylight now, and they have engaged the enemy, and they have discomfited them. They have devastated them, and they have begun to chase them down the mountain passageways, down to Beth Oren, one of these cities outside of Jerusalem, on a major pathway or, or trade route or routes to and from that region, that area, and they're chasing them down. It's now daylight, and as they are slaying the Canaanites, God sends a hailstorm. Now, this is a miraculous hailstorm. This is an unusual hailstorm. Some of the ways in which we know that is because these hailstones were, first of all, very large, which would have been unusual in a semi-arid environment where it didn't get a lot of rain. These hailstones were very effective in that they killed more enemy soldiers than the actual Israelite army did with the sword. The hailstones killed more of the enemy than the Israelite army did with the sword. These hailstones were selective. They killed only the enemy soldiers. Isn't that fascinating? That these hailstones came down and they somehow missed the Israelite soldiers and only hit the Canaanites. It was widespread. This storm was all along that route down to Azekah in that area coming up toward Jerusalem and 
in that mountainous region. These hailstones were precise and that they were only along that pathway as the Canaanite army retreated. So it was a precise storm in that it was just that area. I know that occasionally we see something like this where you're in an area and you have a storm and hail might hit one side of the street rather than the other. We had a hail storm pass through Indianapolis at our first house and caused some roof damage and we got a new roof out of it. But it's unusual for Obviously, it was a miraculous hailstorm. It was done by God himself so that only the enemy soldiers were hit. And then it was only along that pathway as the Canaanites were retreating. It was in a specific area. And it was also prophetic. It was large, effective, selective, widespread, precise, and also prophetic. Because it reminds us of Revelation 16 and verse 21 when God sends hail on his enemies. We see in this this battle, in this passage, we see that God is for his people. God is for his people. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We don't deserve it. It's only by his mercy and his grace, but God is for his people. Israel obeyed and God demonstrated his miraculous power and showed himself strong for his people. We're reminded again as we see over and over in this study of the book of Joshua, the faithful obedience of God's people and God doing his miraculous work, God defeating his enemies, but God's people still must be obedient and they still must be faithful. And we see it again as we have talked about it over and over that we are to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling knowing that it is God that worketh in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we live in that tension, and we live in that balance. So God is for his people. We've seen vengeance against these new converts, this revenge. We've seen the rescue, and this rescue continues, not just with this miracle, but with another miracle, a supernatural, yes, the hell storm was supernatural, But the next miracle that God performs is of epic proportions. Let's drop down to verse number 12. Then Joshua, excuse me, then spake Joshua to the Lord. In the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it, or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. The sun stood still. We read very clearly, the sun stood still and the moon stayed. Repeated for emphasis is the recording in a history book, a non-inspired history book, the book of Jasher. It's mentioned in one other place in scripture. I believe it's in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 18. It's a history book that appears to be maybe a recording of Hebrew Uh, military victories, uh, military history. It's an uninspired, a non-inspired book, but repeated here for emphasis, the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. This is where the interpretational challenge comes. Some commentators, they want to say that the sun and the moon were figurative, that it's just a reference to a Uh, figurative staying power, the sun and the moon were witnesses, in a sense, in a figurative way to the victory that God gave Israel. Uh, Some have tried to say, well, this is just an eclipse, maybe like what we had back in April. And it was some sort of atmospheric phenomenon. But I want us to understand, when we interpret Scripture, we interpret Scripture by Scripture, 
We interpret scripture literally with the plain sense and where there is a need for figurative language. Of course, God in his, inspira in his inspiration of the, the scriptures, he would use human literary devices such as metaphors and similes and all of those wonderful literary terms that all the kids in school can't stand but are important for them to know. We even see a literary technique in this chapter because there is a general explanation and then at the end of the chapter there's a going back in and filling in some of the details. That's a literary technique that even is used in the book of Genesis in chapters 1 and 2 where there's a general statement of creation and then there's a going back and filling in the details. We do this all the time. We read, I know as a sports fan, I read articles about sports all the time and I read the first paragraph and it gives me a general explanation of what happened in the ball game. And then the rest of the article goes back and fills in all the details. So I'll read that the Giants won, which doesn't happen very often, but I'll read that the Giants won, and, and there'll be a general statement about how they won in the first couple of paragraphs, and it goes back, and it'll talk about how Matt Chapman hit two home runs, and uh, Mike Gostromski hit a three-run home run, and uh, Lamont Wade Jr. hit two home runs. And it'll fill in all those details. That's a literary technique that we are used to. We, we, we see it all the time. It's not unusual. God used the personality and the skills and the ability of the writers as he inspired his holy word. So all that being said, there's not figurative metaphorical language here. This is the God of the universe who created the universe with the words of his mouth, the breath of his mouth. In six literal 24-hour days, God created the entire universe and rested on the seventh. This is the God of the universe keeping Daylight, holding the sun, likely in the rotation with the earth as the earth rotates around the sun, orbits around the sun, keeping that rotation with the earth, the sun and the earth keeping in rotation so there would be daylight for a whole other day. God can do that. We read in Colossians 1 and verse 17 that he holds the universe together, by him all things consist. The God of the universe who created this universe, surely he can hold the universe together long enough for there to be extra daylight for a whole day. In the meantime, what is going on? Joshua and the army are down in the valley or on that pathway going down out of Jerusalem battling the Canaanites. It was Joshua led by God in the will of God to cry out and say, God, give us more time. Give us more daylight. Pleading, there's a victory that is near that you have promised, but we just need some more daylight. Remember, they had marched all night. They had now fought for however many, roughly probably 12 hours of daylight, and then Joshua is asking for more. And he's not, only ask, not only is he asking for more daylight, but he's asking for strength to do the fight, to win the battle, to finish with victory in the conflict. I believe that this was an epic miracle. Supernatural, where God held the universe together and allowed for the sun and the earth to rotate together long enough for there to be a whole day of daylight for Joshua and the army of Israel to finish the defeat of the Canaanites. God delivered this land to Israel in clearly supernatural, miraculous fashion. It was a clear sign of God's hand. And it was a rebuke of the false gods of the Canaanites who worshiped the sun and the moon who often had pantheistic, polytheistic beliefs where the weather and the sun and the moon and, and their sacrifices and their superstitious uh, rituals they thought could somehow bring the rain or cause the sun and the moon to be in their favor. And so God was even rebuking the false gods of the Canaanites as he held the sun and the moon. And again, it was such a significant miracle that it was even recorded in this 
non-canonical, non-inspired history book, the book of Jasher. Joshua and his army, God gave them, in a sense, superhuman strength to fight after marching all night and now fighting all day. And then we come down in verse 15, toward the end of the battle. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp to Gilgal. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda. We go down through verse 27. We won't read all the verses. But after they conquered the armies, here's these chicken kings who ran into a cave and put a stone over it and hid. What kind of a leadership is that, right? Is their armies out there and they see their armies being defeated. They don't stay out in the battle. They go run in the cave and hide. I just think they're, they're chickens. But Joshua, after he finishes with the army, defeating these Canaanite, this Canaanite army, this five-king confederate army, he now goes to this cave and he has these five kings pulled out and he assassinates them. He kills them. Now we... We, we, we struggle with this. There, there's a part of us in our 21st century, we've got to be careful because we want to read 21st century war Geneva Convention rules and we want to apply them to this time frame in human history. First of all, the Canaanite people, their sin was ripe. They had had centuries to repent and they had rejected God. They were full of sin and immorality. They were a violent people. We could go to Leviticus and read of some of the sexual sins, including human sacrifices. These five kings were war criminals. These were not just innocent kings who were just good old guys who were fighting a battle and hid into the cave and then they deserved to be spared. No. These were war criminals. They had led their people in the massacre of human life in that region. They had led their people in rank, pagan, idolatrous, pantheistic, polytheistic, immoral behavior that included, as we understand from both biblical recordings as well as extra biblical archaeological that verifies what the Bible already says is true that these people committed child sacrifice. We have taken in our own modern warfare and we have applied the Geneva Convention and we have taken war criminals and we have executed them. In a sense what Joshua and Israel were doing in the judicial system of God they were executing known war criminals who had defied God and lived in their rebellion and led the people in immorality and idolatry and all the polytheism and pantheism. It seems harsh in our minds by our 21st century love is love and this therapeutic Jesus that we seem to have today. We have such a misunderstanding of the holiness of God. The damning aspect, the damning aspect of our sinfulness that if not for the grace and mercy of God, we would get what we deserve and that is hell forever without God. We, we in our 21st century thinking, we struggle with Joshua 10 and this is not an easy passage to preach. This is a difficult passage. I don't want to ever appear standing behind this pulpit that I am hooping and hollering and throwing a party for Joshua chapter number 10. This is sobering. It delights my heart in that we see the holiness of God, we see the justice of God, we see the judgment for sin, but it is very sobering to read because if not for the grace of God, I'm one of those kings. I'm one of those Canaanite people. And we have to see the holiness of God and we have to see God's hatred for sin. We have to see sin for what it is and how it condemns us. So these are war criminals executed by proper justice under the judgment of God. 
So as we close, I just want to finish with two quick lessons from this. If we were to take the time to then read verses 28 all the way through verse 43, we would read some of the details as Israel then breaks the back. Literally, this battle broke the back of the Canaanites for the entire southern part of Canaan, which would later become the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah and, and Benjamin. When the kingdom of Israel split into two kingdoms, this campaign broke the back of the Canaanites in the entire southern half of Canaan. And God in his providence and his inspired word, he, he gives us the details of how they took out and how they conquered the various cities. There were 12 major cities in this southern part of Canaan. All 12 of those are conquered. There would be some mopping up campaigns. There would still be some groups here and there that they would have to deal with. But for the most part, the battles, the major battles in the southern half were, were done. But I want us to see two lessons. Joshua marched all night, 4,000 feet up to take on the enemies of Gibeon. And lesson number one, I think, that we need to see is that there are some long days in the Christian life. But they're worth it. God uses the long days in our lives to strengthen us, to grow our faith, to cause us to trust him, maybe even to purge out some sin. There have been some long days in the ministry. There have been some long days in the Christian life. They were hard days. But I look back now and I see God was working in my heart. God was doing business in my life. There are hard days, aren't there, as parents? <laughs> There are some long days as parents. Sometimes it's just trying to train and disciple and keep the house in order. But those days are worth it. Think of the investment that we make as we pour our lives into our kids and our grandkids. And we teach them right from wrong. We teach them good and evil. We teach them to love God and we bring them to church and we point them to the Savior. Those are sometimes hard days, sometimes days where you feel like all you do all day is discipline and wipe snotty noses or drive as a chauffeur to various ball games and school and appointments and work. And there's late nights sometimes where they come home and they unload. And for an hour, you sit there and you talk. And it's now midnight, but it was well worth it. As you lie on the pillow, you put your head down, and you're weary. And you know it's, the alarm is going back off at 5 o'clock in the morning. But you're thankful for that hour that you spent with your child or your grandchild. Or with some family member. Working out something. Applying the truth of God's word trying to know God's will. There are long days. Joshua had a long day. They marched all night. They went 4,000 feet up. But it was all in obedience to God. And it's all worth it when it's in obedience to God, when it's in God's will. Every long day, every hard day, every snotty nose, every diaper, every meal, every errand, every hard schedule is worth it when it's done for the Savior to point our family, to point others to Jesus Christ. Joshua spent a day in battle and another day. Can you imagine how exhausted they were at the end of that? But God is working. God is doing business in our hearts and our lives. He is bringing the victory, and it may not always be the victory that we think. It may be, yes, an enemy that has defeated a sin pattern that is broken, a confession that is made, a relationship that is restored, and praise God for that. But sometimes the victory is internal. It's God doing a work in my own hearts, and our own hearts, that changes the way I now live as a husband, or as a wife, or a grandparent, or a parent, or as a church member, and however God is working. We want God's miraculous work in our lives. And we want souls saved. As a pastor, I want to see souls saved. I want to see fathers and mothers step up at home. 
I want to see young people keep their eyes on the Lord and serve him all their days. I long for that. I want those miraculous works. But it means also that we have to put in the work in our faith of knowing God's word, of being faithful to church, of taking that time, even on busy, busy weeks, that we make sure that we take time for God, for his word, to study, to meditate, that we remain faithful in what God has given us to do. We may not have to march 5,000 feet up in hilly terrain on a mountain, the side of a mountain, all night and fight a physical battle all the next day, but there are spiritual battles that we face that sometimes feel like that, don't they? But they're worth it. We want easy, though. We have a culture that wants easy, that wants comfort and casual and convenience all the time in every place and every way, but that's not life. And that's not the Christian life. The Christian life requires the hard work of spiritual battle, of putting on the whole armor of God, of personal and spiritual disciplines, of Bible study, prayer, service, sacrifice, church attendance, obedience, and all the faithful applications of God's word in our relationships and in every area of our lives. It takes work. Most often, spiritual victories, growth, Christ-likeness, they're forged in times of suffering, serving, sacrifice, obedience, faithfulness, perseverance. We aren't willing sometimes to do the radical spiritual amputations that are necessary to cut off the hand that offends, to pluck out the eye that offends. But we want God's greatest blessings, but we're not willing to repent and to do the radical spiritual amputations. How did Israel see the epic supernatural miracles by being obedient, and being faithful, by just going into the land and taking on the enemy head on and going into the valley and doing the battle and then trusting the Lord to bring the victory? They didn't know it was going to be a hailstorm and a literal halting of the universe but that's what god did and that leads me to lesson number two as we close the terrorist organizations hamas hezbollah houthi rebels palestinian authority all the other enemies of israel they can try try all they want but they are going to fail this is god's land God miraculously, we read it right here in Joshua chapter number 10, that God miraculously gave this land to Israel. He brought a miraculous hailstorm. He held the universe in place to give Israel the victory to show that it was God doing his work for his people, for his purpose, and this land belongs to him. And it belongs to him to this day. Belongs to God's people to this day. They will eventually get all the borders that God declared they would get in the Abrahamic covenant. And they can try all they want. All the enemies of Israel can try all they want. But I think it's very clear from Joshua chapter 10 that this land belongs to God. And these terrorist organizations and these other enemies of Israel, they will fail. The Antichrist is going to come along in the book of Revelation, and he's going to fail too. He is going to be defeated. Satan will lose. So as we apply these lessons, let us close with 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. The triumph comes only through Christ. May we be faithful and obedient and trusting him for the victory. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these supernatural miracles that you did on behalf of God's people. Very evident, very public, very obvious miracles that declared that you were for your people and that this land belonged to you and still does. And we look forward to the day when you will rule and reign as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the rod of iron on your throne in Jerusalem. And we look forward to the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth. But Lord, while we wait for 
the day of your coming, may we be faithful and obedient right now to do all that you've given us to do, even in the battles, even in the long days and the hard days, trusting you and being faithful. Lord, I ask that you will do your work in our hearts even as we close with this final song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jake's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn, hymn number